So then we have like several studios. Um, yeah, like a lot of studios. I don't know like how long, but it used to be a uh, school. Yeah, so hence why you can see the whole format and everything. I'm trying to figure out the pink background <laughs> and what I could use them for. Because this is like the largest pink I've ever done. Um, with backgrounds, I'm used to starting with a um, very plain white background and then see what comes out of it. Um, but this is pink and pink is good. Pink is for boys. <laughs> Paint defines a lot um, for my practice. Um, I like to make paintings, drawings. Um, I, I just like the feel and sense of color and pigment um, because that is also what I studied um, as a younger artist. And I really, really like colors and how it evolves into whatever on the canvas, whether to figures or whether to just changing the background constantly of the surface. Well, the first knowledge I got as a younger artist or younger human being, I think at the age of 17, was my mom figuring it out for me, which most parents do. She, she took me to like my first art teacher, um, who taught me a lot about Western art. So there at 17, I was already read, learning about art movements like the Renaissance. Um, he sort of exposed me to history books around, um, so like, it used to sound really funny because when he says things like Rococo, I'm like, what's Rococo? But this took further, um, education to broaden my mind about these art movements which are mostly European. In the end, I settled to be a painter, um, but over the years, a lot of other elements of uh, mediums and way of thinking have actually gone into my practice. So within my practice, I actually at the time, I didn't want to be a painter, I just want to be a visual artist. Um, because it burdens the interpretation. Because when I say I'm a painter, it's just like, ah, oh, it's just paint, which is okay, it's less boring too. Um, so, but as a creative, I just wanted to do whatever I like in my studio. But I guess that is also a reflection of my background of um, having a general art practice in school. Uh, which makes art less boring for me. I want to touch the clay and make things out of them. I want to make photographs because then video wasn't really a thing. It, it wasn't as large as it is now. Within my background, I started with stories that we are very peculiar, we were very familiar. There was nothing really... Um, was the world strange about my first um, growing up as a young artist? <laughs> but um, people were not really talking about those issues. And so I felt that um, I could use my work to uh, narrate these stories um, by empowering the story and not just focusing on the crisis of because um, I started with female body and the women and so I wanted to just paint really beautiful women whether they are doing daily chores of making their kids hair or um, daily chores of fending for their family and, and, and just celebrating and dancing um, within my cultural um, stories. So I, I just started with female body, but, but, but after a while, you just find other very interesting topics to focus on. So I, I actually was struggling then, um, personally. So I started with my personal journey. So I did a lot of works around closet in a closet series and a lot of other um, themes around sexuality. Um, then, b because 
it's not to make them, it's we are to show them. So um, you, like, I found that they like so much struggle to make work and then not show them. Um, especially then, now I could say, hey, I am making this work for me and I don't ever want to put it out there. Um, and it's not because I'm afraid or anything like I was when I was younger, but because I just don't want to show them. In Nigeria, Stafford just playing silently with these um, issues which started from my personal journey. So I was constantly using my body, bodies of my lovers and bedmates. After a while, I wanted to trace the history of what I'm working on. And if I could find any historical connection around me. So I started looking at history around traditional system of sexuality um, within the northern part of Nigeria, uh, within Yoruba culture, within different systems, within Igbo culture, um, which is just around me in my environment as a Nigerian. And I, I was a bit amused by these uh, new findings because um, of the denial within people and what they say, um, trying to just erase this very beautiful and interesting um, way of living that we had um, before we are given a Bible, before we consciously started to erase um, our identity whether through um, a very British, structurally British constructed um, educational system or a very deliberate attempt um, using the Bible. For me, activism is not about constantly shouting. Um, it's about educating the next person so that we could maybe, after a while, see results. And, and I think um, it, it wasn't only me that was in the movement. Um, we had a lot of, um, I had a lot of other comrades who were like very feminist, but they were not artists. Let's say within the last eight years, it's been a movement in very local spaces, Nigeria. Um, but Nigerians use social media as a tool a lot, whether to insult you on Twitter, to educate you and insult you on Facebook and also insult you on Instagram. So, but within the last uh, few years, I think I would say that um, educating people, whether slowly, gradually, um, it's, it's, it's very, uh, what's the word? It has result, um, even if not instant, but over time, let, let me just assume like five years, I have seen people um, evolve um, and just change, not because they want to tolerate, but because the history is there, you know, even, in, even if we say it's 2021, the history is still there, so why ignore it? And why do we want to choose one pattern or system of thinking or life or social system or community building? So for me, um, my first few years, which is also recently, um, I was traveling between um, Lagos and the Netherlands because I felt that I was not done um, researching queerness within Nigeria, also looking at the underground queer communities um, in Lagos. So I, I used to just travel also because it's easy to do and maybe I was a bit homesick, so I just like to live between two spaces for the first, um, I think for the first two and a half years, I think. But in 20, towards the end of 2019, I was questioning what, of course, it's very obvious that um, the Netherlands is more advanced and less homophobic. It, of course, homophobia is always present everywhere because people struggle with things they do not know. And instead of them to ask questions, they fight. So I started looking at Amsterdam and the Netherlands to say, okay, what kind of queer people would I want to meet? So I started looking at stories of 
people running from home and trying to seek safety um, within the Netherlands. And really interesting stories that, that, that came out of, of that experience. And so I was, I think I made about five portraits from those stories of large, large drawings. And two of which are in the Amsterdam Museum. Um, queer people are fabulous and queer people are great people. And I, I didn't like the, like from um, in Nigeria, I didn't like the hypocrisy of hiding this story because that's where it all started from. Whatever I do now in this very accepting, very queerly international space started from secrecy. So I, I wanted to, within my practice, to see how to amplify these voices and, and trail the history and tell it as it is. When I was in the North, um, I had a lot of gay men who, I met, sorry, met a lot of gay men who were just existing as, as queer people. They were not defined as gay. There was no LGBT rainbow. There was no, no alphabet labeling. Um, but I would use the word queerness because it's a more fluid box to construct such sexual identity uh, within traditional practices. And the, I had one who was making my hair, you know, and, and this is like several kilometers away from Lagos. And also around Lagos, we have these traditional systems. And then to the east, around the Igbo culture, we have this traditional system. So why do you think Christianity, which is um, which is a baby compared to our civilization, um, holds more power to these stories that are being um, shadowed. I've always constantly used masking in my work. It, it doesn't matter who is behind it, and the gender roles don't play. It's not a male. It's not a female. It could be anything, but within African system, when you put on a mask, you become a spirit. So I like this kind of demas very demas demystified, um, fluid system, which we do not know we have. You know, like, we don't see it as an identity thing. We see it as a very cultural, traditional thing. We don't see it, we don't interpret it as how very fluid the body becomes when it is embodied by a mask. You drop your shame, you drop your ego, you drop everything, and then you just, I, I'll say yourself, whether it's a shy person, you just act, what's the word, um, much more than you would when you don't wear a mask. So it's a very liberating um, object, I think. Um, when it comes to dealing with identity and sexuality, it doesn't matter. I'm not talking about the other dark sides of what people could use marks for that to manipulate and create crisis. I'm looking at it as um, an object for fluidity, an object to, to become. Because these are like childhood memories of how I remember them um, in Igara and then several years later reenacting it um, in my new fun home of Amsterdam. The body is the story, the body is the home, the body is um, a collection of our ancestry, I'll say, because um, that is my great aunt, and if I look at her properly, I would see how related we are with the nose or with the lips. So uh, the body is also history, you know, you, it's what we could pass from one person to the other, if we choose to, if we don't want to reproduce, is also okay. So I, I think um, finding a sense of place, whether as a physical place or whether we're going through systems of thinking around spirituality, whether whatever structure or construct, I think um, we need the body to activate that. So for me, safe space is how people find each other and create community. 
I think that I would say, and also find place for healing, even within this community. So even if I find a community and I'm not healing, then it's not safe for me. I have to exit. Um, it doesn't have to always solve problems though, but because uh, queer people go through mental, emotional, or sort of very traumatic crisis, then whatever space that I find myself or I seek to be safe needs to also provide healing. Because um, the, the thing is, as queer people, we've gone through all forms of bashing by the society, um, trying to always hide from our families because family is important. Um, we kind of build very, how will I put it, war, like we build like a lot of war in our head. So most times, instead of just never responding, we just fight, like impulse. So in the end, we might be in a so-called safe space, but we end up just fighting and sabotaging each other. Um, this is because we have refused to pause to think and find healing, because I think if we are like um, 10 people in a safe space and we consciously try strive to heal um, and then if one person starts it and others are able to tap into it um, then we'll create a very healthy community but if the other group refuse to to heal then we would sabotage the whole safe space and then we have nothing to to hold on to so I think a safe space for me, uh, very importantly, would be a place where I find healing. <laughs>